Welcome to the Unit 5 Summary Video for Heredity. This recap is going to briefly review all of the Unit 5 topics according to the College Board curriculum, which accounts for 8 to 11% of the AP exam. Here are the timestamps for each subtopic if you prefer to skip around. Don't forget that you can always download the podcast and watch our YouTube channel for more help. You printed the Unit 5 study guide already, right? Good. Let's zoom out. Living things are currently classified into one of three domains of life, archaea, bacteria, and eukarya. And in order for all living things to continue on, well, living. The secret code of life has to be stored in DNA and RNA and passed on from one generation to the next. We see this as the process of heredity occurring throughout all three domains. And they have a ton of other things in common too, like the presence of ribosomes, genetic code, and even the same metabolic pathways. Each of these crossovers provides evidence that all organisms are linked through shared common ancestry. Let's zoom in. A human karyotype is organized into 23 homologous pairs. These homologous chromosomes are a similar size and carry similar, but not identical, information. The chromosomes you have in each of your cells right now came from your parents' gametes. With homologous chromosomes from egg and sperm pairing back up during random fertilization. Even though genetic siblings are from the same gene pool, random fertilization contributes to genetic variation. Following the same logic, the process of cell division by meiosis is to separate homologous pairs into separate gametes. Meiosis occurs in sex organs, such as testes and ovaries, and includes the familiar steps of prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. However, in order to reduce the chromosome number, the cells will need to go through PMAT twice. And since it would be difficult for me to draw meiosis with 23 pairs, let's stick with 2n equals 4 for this example. Just like mitosis, prophase 1 begins with DNA condensing from chromatin into chromosomes and the nuclear membrane disappearing. Unlike mitosis, prophase 1 has homologous chromosomes pairing up to exchange segments of DNA by the process of crossing over. Homologous chromatids literally swap genes, which means that some of the chromosomes distributed into gametes are now genetically different from the parent cell. This event of crossing over is called recombination, and it's one of the main contributors to genetic variation in gametes. In metaphase 1, spindle fibers extend to arrange homologous pairs in a random order in the middle of the cell. Imagine that there are 20 students in your biology class, and the teacher asks you to pair up with someone that is approximately your height and line up in the middle of the room. Some of you are lined up on the left, while others are on the right. Similarly, homologous chromosome pairs are arranged by spindle fibers during metaphase 1 at random. There are no rules that say all genes from mom must be on the left to go into specific gametes, while dad's genetic material needs to be on the right. There are over 8 million different combinations possible for our 23 pairs of homologous chromosomes but only four combinations for our example cell. This random arrangement of homologous pairs is called independent assortment and is yet another contributor to genetic variation. When spindle fibers shorten in anaphase one, homologous pairs are separated. The alleles of genes located on non-homologous chromosomes separate without influencing each other. And because centromeres are still intact, our chromosomes are in the familiar X shape with sister chromatids connected. Telophase 1 and cytokinesis usually overlap, but we won't form the nuclear membranes or uncoil DNA into chromatin just yet. With meiosis 1 complete, we now have two haploid daughter cells. Meiosis 1 and meiosis 2 are consecutive, with no interface separating them. Meiosis 2 will also follow PMAT, with a lot of similarity to the steps of mitosis, because the purpose here is to make a copy of the haploid cells we've already created. Prophase 2 has spindle fibers attached to centromeres, metaphase 2 has chromosomes pulled to the middle of the cell, anaphase 2 has sister chromatids separated, and telophase 2 has DNA uncoiled into chromatin and nuclear membranes reformed. Division of the cytoplasm is the final step with cytokinesis to form a total of four haploid daughter cells, each genetically unique from each other and from the original diploid parent cell. Often, haploid cells continue to differentiate for specialized functions, like how sperm have a flagella. The process of meiosis is influenced by which sex organ is doing the gametogenesis. 
the age of the organism, varying hormone levels, and even environmental factors. For example, human males can produce sperm from puberty until death, whereas human female ovaries begin meiosis of their egg cells prior to their own birth, continue at puberty, and only finish meiosis too if fertilization occurs. In contrast, cats reproduce seasonally and clownfish are protandrous able to activate dormant female reproductive parts if there's a need within a population. Don't worry, you don't have to know all the details of any sexual reproduction cycles for plants or animals on the AP exam. Before we move on to genetics, let's pause to contrast the process of meiosis and mitosis. It can get confusing because they have a bunch of terminology and processes overlapping. So, the purpose of mitosis is to grow, repair, and reproduce asexually, while the purpose of meiosis is to form gametes for sexual reproduction. Mitosis creates two identical diploid cells through one division of PMAT, while meiosis forms four genetically unique haploid cells through two divisions. Meiosis involves crossing over during prophase one and independent assortment in metaphase one, while mitosis does not. Lastly, mitosis involves a separation of sister chromatids only, while meiosis first separates homologous pairs in anaphase one and then separates sister chromatids in anaphase phase two. Gregor Mendel was an Austrian monk and farmer who had the power of keen observation. He wasn't exactly what we would classify today as a scientist. While tending the monastery garden in the 1850s, Mendel noticed that certain traits appeared more often than others, while some traits seemed to disappear and reappear with time. It's really convenient that Mendel experimented with pea plants. They're very small, with observable phenotypes, have quick generation times, and make tons of offspring. Also, you can easily control mating through self and cross fertilization. For his contributions to genetics, Gregor Mendel is regarded as the father of heredity. Okay, clearly this isn't a history class, but there are some big names in bio that you should recognize, like Mendel with heredity, Watson and Crick with DNA, and Darwin with evolution. Please don't get hung up on specific dates with any of their contributions, but do acknowledge their big picture role and concept association. If the scientists show up on the exam as part of a question, there should be enough info in the prompt for you to recall their discoveries. And any questions relevant to their experiments are more likely to be application-based anyways. Two of Mendel's biggest observations are highly rooted in meiosis and the manner in which homologous chromosomes separate. The first one I've already mentioned, which is the law of independent assortment. Alleles of genes located on non-homologous chromosomes will separate during meiosis one without influencing each other. So long as two genes are on different chromosomes, there won't be a greater chance of inheriting them together. They are not linked. This is just like how flipping two coins next to each other won't influence how they land. The second observation is the law of segregation, which states that the two alleles for each gene will separate during meiosis as diploid cells become haploid. So long as there hasn't been a meiotic error, you will end up with homologous chromosomes in the same gamete. Both of Mendel's laws can only be applied to genes that are on different chromosomes. Most of solving genetic problems is to look for patterns in order to explain and interpret results. This is a lot easier if you can get into the habit of always making yourself a key to look back at for reference. And when you think you've solved it, reread the question again to make sure you've interpreted your results properly. This summary video includes a brief overview of Punnett squares and pedigrees, but there are a lot more genetic problems to solve with in-depth explanations on the practice sheet. Oh, and chi-square will be on there too. To solve genetic problems, we need to keep a few terms in mind. Alleles are alternate forms of a gene, which combine to create an organism's genotype. A heterozygous genotype has two different alleles, while a homozygous has two of the same, either dominant or recessive. By convention, dominant alleles are written first if present. So a heterozygous genotype would be capital P, then lowercase p. Genotypes are interpreted to create an organism's phenotype, the physical expression of the trait. Let's review the classic monohybrid one trait example for complete dominance. In flower expression, a purple phenotype is dominant to white. Consider a cross between two heterozygous purple flowers and interpret the genotypes and phenotypes of the offspring. When we set up our Punnett square, the parental alleles are independently aligned outside the squares. This models the formation of gametes during meiosis. Just like the distributive property in math, it doesn't matter if mom's alleles are written across the top of the Punnett square or down the side you'll get the same answer. Each box within the Punnett square has a restored diploid number, representing a potential offspring when alleles from each parent rejoins as homologous chromosomes during fertilization. 
Okay, interpreting the results of our cross, we have a 1 to 2 to 1 genotypic ratio with one homozygous dominant, two heterozygous, and one homozygous recessive. Phenotypically, there is a 3 to 1 ratio of purple to white since purple is dominant. The white phenotype reappears in the F1 generation since both parents were carriers of the recessive allele. You can also complete genetic problems that follow two traits in a dihybrid cross. Sticking with peas, imagine we had a cross between two heterozygous parents plants where purple is still dominant to white and tall is dominant to short. We are going to foil our parent genotypes to get each of their gametes and then distribute them into the offspring boxes. A heterozygous cross needs a 16 box square and will produce a phenotypic ratio of 9 to 3 to 3 to 1. The primary difference in non-Mendelian genetics is in how we interpret genotypic and phenotypic ratios in offspring. As for alleles, there are conventional ways for writing these types of problems, so as to distinguish them from standard dominant scenarios. But so long as you interpret the results correctly, you can really write them however you want. Even though these are different scenarios, it is the same process of completing Punnett squares and applying the rules of probability. First up, incomplete dominance, which is neither allele fully dominant over the other and so both are partially expressed when present. Consider the snapdragon flower with alleles for the color red and white. A homozygous flower can either be phenotypically red or white, but a heterozygous flower exhibits an entirely new intermediate phenotype, pink. Another example of incomplete dominance is sickle cell anemia. A heterozygous individual has sickle cell trait, with some cells normally shaped and others sickle shaped. Sickle cell anemia is also a great example of evolution within humans. A sickle cell trait provides malaria resistance in certain environments. Next, multiple alleles and codominance, which are both shown with blood typing. There are three alleles in the population that control the foundation of your blood type allele A, B, and O. But even though there are three alleles, you can still only inherit two because, you know, two parents and those homologous chromosomes. A and B are codominant over the recessive allele O. Considering all combinations, there are four primary phenotypes, A, B, AB, or O. Each blood type dictates different antigens expressed on the cell and antibodies produced in the plasma to distinguish self from non-self. Here is an example of a Punnett square that produces all four blood types from a single cross. The rhesus factor is an additional antigen present, which is how we have blood types such as AB positive or O negative. In humans, females are genetically XX, whereas males are genetically XY. The Y chromosome, although very small, contains the SRY gene, which leads to the development of male characteristics, like testes. The overwhelming majority of sex-linked traits are located on the X chromosome and are recessive. Since males only have one X chromosome, they are hemizygous, which will always express the trait if inherited. For this reason, sex-linked recessive disorders like red-green colorblindness and hemophilia are more common in men and often pass from unaffected mothers to affected sons in pedigrees. It should be noted that some other species have sex determination with different chromosomes, like ZW in birds and haplodiploidy in bees. The patterns that Mendel observed were true for genes located on different chromosomes, or at least those that were far apart on the same chromosome due to crossing over. But when genes are located close enough to each other on the same chromosome, they are more often inherited together and are said to be linked. How close they are on a chromosome can be determined using data from genetic crosses to calculate recombination frequency, or the number of offspring that show a recombination of traits not seen in the parental generation. This segregation probability data can be further applied to calculate relative distance from one another on the chromosome. This is often expressed as map units or centimorgans, named after geneticist Sir Thomas Hunt Morgan. The recombination frequency can never be greater than 50%, since this would indicate that the alleles are sorting independently. Several traits are the product of multiple genes, like skin pigmentation and eye color. These are termed polygenetic traits and result in a phenotypic range within a population. Be careful, don't confuse this with pleiotropic traits, like Marfan syndrome, which result in one gene affecting multiple characteristics. Epistasis occurs when the phenotypic expression of one gene affects the expression of another gene. Sometimes it depends on the other gene for expression, while other times it even masks or covers it up. You won't find the term epistasis in the AP Bio CED, but it provides another example of non-Mendelian genetics at work, and I give a full recap in episode 66. 
Lastly, there's non-nuclear inheritance. Remember that both chloroplasts and mitochondria derive from independent prokaryotic cells by endosymbiosis. They both contain their own DNA, which can be expressed as part of an individual's phenotype. But here's the cool part. In animals, mitochondria are only found in egg cells, not sperm. And for plants, mitochondria and chloroplasts are only found in ovules, not pollen. So both plants and animals have non-nuclear traits that are only maternally inherited. Phenotypic plasticity refers to the ability of an organism to exhibit different phenotypes in changing environmental conditions. Their genotype stays the same, but the expression is different. For example, phenotypic plasticity in Arctic animals' fur color allows for adaptation to changing seasons. Camouflage in snowy winters and darker hues in summer aid survival by optimizing thermal regulation and predator avoidance. Increased UV light causes more melanin production in animals, which alters phenotype. Temperature can even influence sex determination during embryonic development in reptiles. Cooler temperatures tend to produce males, while warmer temperatures result in females, highlighting the role of temperature-sensitive genes. Regardless of the strategy, the ability to respond to environmental changes provides organisms with evolutionary advantage. Certain human genetic disorders can be attributed to the inheritance of a single changed allele or chromosomal error. For example, non-disjunction occurs when homologous chromosomes or sister chromatids don't properly separate during meiosis. This can occur with autosomal or sex chromosomes and can result in non-viable gametes or gametes with an extra or missing chromosome. One example is trisomy 21, or Down syndrome, where there is a third copy of the 21st chromosome. Sickle cell disease is caused by a mutation in the hemoglobin gene on chromosome 11. Tay-Sachs disease is an autosomal recessive disorder that damages brain cells with an error on chromosome 15. And Huntington's disease is a progressive brain disorder that presents later in an individual's life, caused by an error in chromosome 4. Non-disjunction of the sex chromosomes result in conditions like X, Turner syndrome, and XXY, Klinefelter syndrome. The chromosomal basis of inheritance provides an understanding of the pattern of transmission of genes from parent to offspring. Scientists have come up with a handy tool to analyze these patterns with the construction of pedigrees. Males are squares, females are circles, and connect with lines to show reproduction and offspring through generations. The circles and squares are shaded in to show an affected individual. When analyzing pedigrees, you are looking to see if the trait is autosomal or sex-linked, dominant or recessive. Start with recessive first and look for flaws in logic. For example, if two affected parents have some offspring that do not have the trait, then it can't be recessive. Because passing on alleles from two homozygous recessive parents only has one outcome. If you start to see a pattern of an affected mom and a disproportionate amount of affected sons, then it might be sex-linked recessive. If even one parent-to-child interaction doesn't work, then you have the wrong inheritance pattern. To recap. Homologous chromosomes and their alleles segregate during meiosis to form haploid gametes, unless mutation or non-disjunction has occurred. Genetic variation is increased with crossing over, independent assortment, and random fertilization. Mendel might be the father of heredity, but some inheritance patterns show different phenotypic ratios than he originally discovered. Phenotypes can also be modified with changing environmental conditions. When approaching genetic problems, read the prompt, identify the parental gametes, complete a Punnett square, and calculate your phenotypic and genotypic ratios. And that's the end for Unit 5 Heredity. Now it's time to practice. If you've already completed the Unit 5 study guide for this video, then go check your responses with the PDF answer key. There's also the practice sheet, practice video, and practice multiple choice questions available in this unit. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next recap for Unit 6, Gene Expression and Regulation.